Well, we'll keep this thing moving, get into this last article, and then we'll have our Reddit question as we uh, get to the end here. But do you want to, let me get it pulled up, read this headline here. A Christian response to polygamy, incest, and pedophilia. It says, in 1964, Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart defined obscenity or hardcore pornography by simply stating, I know it when I see it. Perhaps this was true for Stewart or even the average American before the sexual revolution. Yet after decades of increasing promiscuity in media, fashion, and other cultural activities, we're deeply desensitized to sexual immorality. We see it, but we don't know it. The normalization of pornography, sex work, um, like with OnlyFans and the LGBT plus ideology, has dulled our moral sensibilities. And sins like polygamy, pedophilia, and incest are only a pair of binoculars away. This may seem to some like fear-mongering alarmism or a version of the slippery slope fallacy so common in public dialogue today. But if you analyze United States laws, polling data, and media, along with a theological understanding of anthropology and sin, such a trajectory becomes arguable, even obvious. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So that's just kind of the opening there. We're not going to spend much time on polygamy and incest. We will just quickly try and summarize what the author is talking about in those regard uh, with those two topics. But we want to focus more on pedophilia. Uh, However, I do want to just read this one last quote in the opening here because I thought it was good. Hmm. Uh, He says, Each of these sins can be argued directly from natural law, yet there are no squabbles between general and special revelation. Christians must be able to defend the sanctity of monogamous male-female marriage and the beauty of chastity against the pagan practices of the modern age. So what follows is a biblical and theological response to polygamy, pedophilia, and incest. So we're covering this largely because, as he says, and we would agree, Christians must be able to defend the sanctity of marriage, male-female relationships, and maybe most importantly, uh, chastity, uh, which has gone by the complete wayside. So let's look uh, at what they have to say uh, about the importance that we defend these different ideas, and we'll start with polygamy. So do you want to read their thoughts on polygamy here? Okay. It says, while polygamy is still technically illegal in the United States, it's in- increasingly common for people to engage in open or polyamorous relationships, along with a host of other non-monogamous relationship types. Polygamy is most common among Muslims in sub-Saharan Africa, though it's still generally uncommon in most parts of the world. However, a 2020 Gallup poll discovered that one in five U.S. adults believes polygamy is morally acceptable, up 13% since 2003. Reality TV has normalized non-monogamous relationships through shows with cult followings like The Bachelor and recently The Secret Lives of Mormon Wives and Couple to the Ruppel, is that how you say it? I suppose. (laughs) Efforts to normalize non-monogamy as a legitimate expression of sexuality have been especially strong in the LGBT plus community. But there's also been a lesser known push from right wing um, manosphere figureheads like Andrew Tate, who claims polygamy is perfectly normal in that the reason the Western world is so degenerate is because men are not allowed to live out their natural male instincts. It's even present in evangelical Christian circles. Vince, how do you say that, Band 2? I guess, yeah. Uh, A Christian history professor at Fuller Theological Seminary was recently accused of practicing and defending polygamy. Just more evidence that anytime you hear something either led by or followed by Fuller Theological Seminary, just go, he is probably wrong. 
They mm-hmm. have fallen hard. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense that people are for having multiple partners at a time before marriage. Why not while you're married? Why is it wrong when you're married? Like, do people care about vows today? <laughs> no, yeah. who doesn't? No, who doesn't think it's wrong even when you're married? Jamal Bryant. And he said so on public television. So there's that. Um, But we have discussed this topic before. So again, that's why we don't want to harp on it too much. But there is a movement looking to make make polygamy great again, if you want to say that. Now, there are those that are just degenerates like Andrew Tate, but some will try and make the claim that it's a biblical mandate for men to take multiple uh, wives. Now, again, we're not going to rehash all of that here. I will just say it's my opinion that Jesus dispels any notion of polygamy being acceptable. In his response to the Pharisees in Matthew, I believe it's chapter 19, um, where he quotes directly from Genesis 2.24. So whatever you might have think or might have what whatever you think happened in the Old Testament to allow polygamy, Christ went back before all of that to make his explanation known about marriage. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, man and woman, all was, you know, good at that point. What God you know what's funny it. is people like to say, oh, but Jesus didn't, we wonder talking about anything else, like, you know, gay marriage, but Jesus didn't speak on it. Here's something Jesus did speak on. And like you said, he went back to Genesis 2 4. Yeah, Genesis 2 He defined 2, it, or 2 24. Yep. And he defined it. So there you go. Jesus said it. He made clear what it is. Yeah. So, I mean, the same case can be made when they talk about, well, Jesus never spoke about homosexuality. He did. Uh, he he basically doubled down and supported the mosaic idea of marriage. If he wanted yeah. to clear it up, he could have, but there he supported go. it. And then in the realm of polygamy, he went back before anything in that Old Testament that took place, and he defined it as the way God defined it in Genesis. Man and mm-hmm. woman, male and female, the two become one flesh. That's the idea of marriage. So that's polygamy. We'll move this thing along and look quickly at incest. Do you want to read about incest? That's always fun to say on a podcast, isn't it? All right. Incest has become more prevalent in entertainment, like in Game of Thrones, although it's likely more for shock value than for intentional normalization. It's still there. And it's at least symptomatic of a culture that enjoys heightening the threshold of perverted sexuality. It's no no coincidence that incest-themed porn known as faux-cest is one of the most searched categories on popular pornography sites. Research has shown a 178% increase in family-related porn, along with the fact that one in 10 Purchases by young adults are for faux cest titles. Incest is explicitly condemned in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In Leviticus 18.6, God prohibits incest. None of you shall approach any one of his close relatives to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. The remainder of the passage, verses 7 through 18, explains in detail the types of relations that are prohibited. In the New Testament, John the Baptist died defending the sanctity of marriage after Herod took his own sister-in-law as a second wife. Um, He cites Mark 6, 17 through 28, and then Leviticus 18, 16. In 1 Corinthians 5.1, Paul rebukes the church, saying, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans, for a man has his father's wife. Uh, There's an obvious through line in Scripture regarding incest. It's a sin. Uh, Yeah, so... um... That was gross. Yeah, that was really icky to read. (laughs) Like they say, incest is increasing. And it's a sad state of affairs again in America when you have to, you know, make this claim that like, well, the porn stats don't lie. So we're trusting in the porn stats here. People are increasingly seeking this kind of content and there has to be a reason for it. Well, you see that sexual perversion 
it doesn't stop. It gets worse and worse and worse. They keep crossing mm-hmm. over lines that they say, you know, oh, I'd never cross that line. Yeah, people are crossing the lines and normalizing it. So Yeah, I mean, that's the whole, uh, you know, that sin that ultimately leads to death. And, you know, it just kind of takes you further down that road where you need more and more. And usually it's grosser and more vile to get you going, as they say, right? So incest in whatever regard is increasing in this country. Um, But again, that's not the focus of what we want to look at today. Maybe just something we need to keep our eye on. It is increasing. Sad state of affairs, but it is. Um, But like they say in here, it is a sin. Clear. So flee from it. But let's look at pedophilia, because that's the one that we're actually concerned with. I'll give you a break from this, honey, if you want, and I can read some of the pedophilia. Yeah, go ahead. So, all right. Pedophilia, it says, in the realm of education, five U.S. states, California, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, and Illinois have adopted comprehensive sexual education, normalizing youth sex and promoting progressive gender ideology. Consider the wide-scale promotion of gender-affirming care for children, social affirmation, puberty blockers, hormone therapy, top and bottom surgery. This is exacerbated by the recent push in states like California to create a wall of secrecy between children and their parents, which undermines the age of consent regarding sexual decisions. This November, California residents will vote on Proposition 3, which seeks to remove language in the California Constitution stating that marriage is between one man and one woman. But this isn't merely an attempt to match the Supreme Court decision of Burgerfell v. Hodges. According to the opposing argument in the General Election Voter Guide, Prop 3 removes all rules for marriage, opening the door to child marriages, incest, and polygamy. It changes California's constitution even though same-sex marriage is already legal. By making moms and dads optional, it puts children at risk. This careless, careless measure harms families and societies. Like, they don't, they don't care at all. Like, what is a parent's role? We need to define, they need to define what is the role of parents? What authority do parents have a a right, you know? It seems like in places like California, your role as a parent is to produce a healthy economic contributor helps produce somebody that can manufacture widgets to be sold so the rich can get rich and they can collect taxes from you. That seems to be their great goal in this society Um, because parents don't really have much of a say in many of the bluest of blue states. Um, Like they said, trying to create a wall of secrecy between the parents. And this is the point that we wanted to discuss And I wanted to discuss it because I think it fits perfectly with the other two stories that we've already talked about today. You know, and going back many episodes, we've talked about this often, people don't know their Bibles. Mm -hmm. And even if they do know their Bibles, they don't believe the Bibles. Again, even if they claim to be Christians, right? One to 2% of Gen Z and millennials are Christians. We've talked about that. And more and more people are getting their ideas of Christian faith from politicians and political plants rather than the Bible itself. They're going to Jamal Bryan's church to be taught about Democrat politics or politics in in place of real Christian faith. They're letting people like, you know, Kamala Harris tell you that you can be pro-choice and have your faith stay intact. You know, you remember Gavin Newsom plastered, I think it was one of the gospel messages, Christ's word all over billboards supporting abortion total blasphemy. So, but again, this idea makes me think of Jamal Bryant because how long before like so-called Christians, you know, whatever you really want to call them, sign off on pedophilia. That's what I was thinking as I was reading this. Because I mean, if you're willing to let a snake like Jamal Bryant convince you that killing your child in the womb is good, acceptable, and righteous in God's eyes, how long before you let them sell you on pedophilia? Because if you can be convinced that aborting your kid or transing your kid, if you can be convinced of that as a Christian, there's mm-hmm. nothing you won't buy into. Well, if they, with the transgender surgery or, you know, just transitioning, the argument is 
well, you have to let them for the sake of their mental health. They're going to, you know, commit suicide if you don't let them do what they want. Well, you can say the same thing. Well, your child wants a relationship with this adult. And if you don't let them, they're going to kill themselves. Like, yeah. And you've made the point a couple times in this show already that their points of view and their worldview is a complete contradiction. And here again is another contradiction because you can't tell a kid that it's their right to do as they wish with their body, even to cut it up, chop it up, transition themselves. And then at the out of the other side of your mouth go, well, you can't also consent to letting your own body be used in a sexual relationship with an adult. It's complete hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. If I'm old enough to talk to a doctor and get myself transitioned from one gender to another, why am I not also old enough to consent to a sexual relationship with an older person? It's complete hypocrisy. It doesn't make any sense, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And again, Many Christians, those filling the sanctuary at Jamal Bryan's church, have already been convinced that somehow aborting your kid, transing your kid is all good, acceptable, and righteous. Um, so why would they stand against this? Right? You've already turned your back on the Bible. You've already made progressive politics your inspired scripture, if you will. And make no mistakes, right? This is why we're talking about this. The DNC is moving towards pedophilia. Mm-hmm. We know they've softened language on it. They're minor attracted people now, right? They're already trying to lay that groundwork. And we already know the political elites and entertainment elites, they're filled with pedophiles. We oh, know yeah. that. Um, that's coming out more and more. So if it's like legal, then they know they won't be in trouble when they're, all this is found out. It's made public. It's like, well, it's legal, so we can't be in trouble for it. Maybe they're just laying the groundwork to to get it going themselves. And you know, places like California, some of the most liberal places in the country, they seem to be leading the uh, pack on this, embracing all of this. Um, And the point is, once they do, once the Californias, the Kamala Harris's, once they embrace this, all of these leftist progressive pastors, they will embrace it as well. Because you're not going to draw a line in the sand and go, I will abortion and transing your kids and no further. This is where I draw the line. Why would you draw the line there? It doesn't make any sense. So they won't. And they will accept this. Um, And if they've got you believing that killing your child is righteous and godly, pedophilia is going to be an easy sell. I know. They're going to have no problem getting you to to buy off on that. They their reasoning to that. Like it just goes along with it. It's insane, but it's something we need to start wrestling with because again, the second progressive politicians, entertainment elites make this switch that pedophilia is now acceptable. These progressive pastors are going to follow suit. They're going to go, because again, they're being, that's the progressive Christian, right? Politics drives their faith rather than the other way around where faith should drive your politics. The article goes on in here and it says, for a culture with the deeply embedded value that consent is all that matters, that's America, we don't care nearly enough about protecting those who cannot give it. Mm. As one scholar argues, to give legally valid consent, a person must possess the cognitive abilities to understand the basic nature of the marital obligation and to voluntarily agree to marry. The same must be true of sexual decisions in general, including the ability to choose gender affirming care. You know, and again, like we talked about, we've already told kids, you've got the ability already, no matter your age, to consent to, um, you know, whatever you want to do with your body. Mm -hmm. So again, how are we going to tell them you don't also have the ability to consent to a sexual relation? Like the surgery, like you can't reverse that, but you can stop being in a relationship, you know, with an adult. Like, so it seems like, transgenderism that's more like a oh it's certainly that's worse. something you it's it's worse in that sense yeah it's but, worse it's irrevocable right and, you know and again we were finding out more and more as these studies come out that even things that they've lied to us about that puberty blockers no that's irreversible too and you're damaging you're letting kids damage themselves i mean they're getting all these things cancer and all kinds of 
other, even like their mental health declines. And I know it is weird having to say that, that that's worse than the, I don't know. It's just weird even. Yeah, it's gross. Um, So you have that, the hypocrisy of trying to say you can cut yourself up and make irrevocable changes to your body as a kid, but now you can't consent to a sexual relation with adult. It's complete hypocrisy. Um, but then you even just add into that, that just the world we live in, a world where all these grownups talking to children about their gender, their sexual preferences, like they're already laying the groundwork of normalizing sexuality between children and adults. Children should be weirded out, uncomfortable. They should Mm -hmm. be telling their parents. I mean, again, if you're in school and your teachers are talking about gender and sexual preferences and sexual ideologies and all these, those aren't teacher, they're perverts. You know, a lot of people don't even go to like a public library anymore because it's filled with, you know, children's books. It's, it's everywhere. Yeah, it's it's pornography. So many children's books that are just pushing that. Like, so I'm in one of these like Facebook groups that kind of call out when people like find these types of books. In a lot of parents are unaware. They're like, oh, the cover looks safe. And you really have to flip through like every page to know if it's safe. Like one of them was just, and it was for like toddlers, like little kids. And it was teaching them, you know, everybody's like the difference in people's bodies, like by one body, not even with gender. They was even talking about belly buttons. So on the page, we're talking about people having different belly buttons. For some reason, all of the pictures, you know, it's cartoon, is people naked from the top up, like men and women, but but they're talking about belly buttons, so unnecessary to have, you know, well, it's all unnecessary. their chest showing, but really weird. Some of them have scars showing they had a transition surgery. Like it was a man, but he had the scars there. Like, so he was a woman before. Inclusive. Um, Absurd. It's just crazy. Since joining this, this Facebook group, I'm just amazed at how many children's books are pushing an agenda. Yeah. It's, pornography, it's perversion. And if we were a more healthy, a more righteous society, these people would be labeled appropriately as perverts and held criminally criminally liable for trying to pervert and sexually abuse young children. Um, But we aren't a righteous society. We're a society that promotes this stuff and goes to court to defend allowing pornography at our elementary schools, while at the same time arguing to remove Bibles by the clergy. No. That's the society wow. we find ourselves in. Evil is good and good is evil. Like we are definitely our kids in are that preyed time. on by perverts and we seem okay with it. Um so let me just finish reading this last little bit here from this article. He says just on the idea of pedophilia. It says the obvious position of Christianity since the inception of the early church is that pedophilia is an evil and grievous sin. One of the earliest Christian documents, the Didache, condemns it under the category of gross sin forbidden. You shall not uh, commit uh, pedophthoros. This is sometimes translated as an associated word, pederasty, which is an ancient term for grown men who have sexual relations with young boys. It was widely practiced and even honored in the Greco-Roman world, but it was unanimously rejected by Christian communities. There are numerous examples of church fathers condemning the practices, but they actually coined a new word for it. That word I can't pronounce. (laughs) Instead of using pederasty or its contemporary pedophilia, which both mean something like child lover, they spoke of this pedophthoros, one who sexually abuses or corrupts children. That's a better, uh, better term there. It says there's something especially wicked about abusing a child. Herman Bavnik lists sex with children as a sin against nature. Song of Solomon or Song of Songs repeatedly warns against awakening love before its time. How much more should we rebuke those who awaken love before the natural maturation timeline of a child? The Mosaic law has clear laws against rape and we're right to call sex with minors a form of it. 
Jesus said it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. The vulnerable and the helpless are most precious in God's kingdom and there's a, their abusers will not go unpunished. Nor should we want them to be unpunished. Um, that's one of the fascinating things. I did that study on the Psalms and how often in the Psalms you read that the wicked be punished by God, that God would come and judge the wicked. We don't pray those prayers a lot in our society today, but you know, I've heard someone say it recently that let's make the imprecatory Psalms mm -hmm. great again. And I think we're getting to that point here in America. So why is this important to Christians? Well, I think this is important because our nation is in the depraved state. It is because Christians have stopped being Christians. You know, we've traded in our heavenly citizenship for worldly citizenship and, you know, citizenship in this world and this country and our children are suffering under the weight of the oppression of our sins. And, mm -hmm. you know, your sin, my sin, right? All sin. Um, and even just your simple acceptance of sin is oppressive. Mm -hmm. You know, our nation's desire for sexual perversion is oppressive for those who desire to live pure lives, yeah. um, as well as those who are unable to defend themselves against your perversion, like children. It's just everywhere. We're saturated in perversion and it's oppressive. And even with that, right, like unborn children, going back to Jamal Bryant, are murdered and they're suffering under the oppression of our nation's I don't know what you want to call it, lust for self-satisfaction and worldly pleasures that sort of fuels our abortion industry. They're being oppressed and suffering under that. Um, and now here we're on the cusp of oppressing our children under the sexual perversion of adults. Uh, and the only people that can turn the tide back on this are Christians, but too many of them seem perfectly mm -hmm. comfortable just going over the cliff with the wicked. Yeah. Uh, again, we've got the clergy taking people to court for teaching the Bible. <laughs> that should be a wake up call. Yeah. Uh, so what are we going to do about it? What should we do about it? Uh, well, I think if we're going to make anything great again, it's a biblical worldview. Let's make a biblical worldview great again. You know, we've tried the world's way. It's perverse. It's ugly. It's oppressive. It's God who sets free. It's God who prospers and he does it rightly and righteously. Um, Christian values, Christian principles are what creates a world where the vulnerable are cared for and the wicked are punished. That's what we should want to see. Godlessness has run its course in this nation and the results are devastating, right? 70 million children dead, sexual perversion, disease have run rampant. We've got broken families, damaged children, and these damaged children go on to be damaged adults that damage children. It's a, it's a cycle. It's a perverse and destructive cycle. And people just hide from the reality of all the brokenness, even in their own family, because everybody's just glued to their phone. So people can just pretend like nothing's happening, you know? Yeah. Technology allows us to not really live in the real world. We cope that way. We cope. We lie about it with, you know on social media, can present our best life now. People think our life, you know, think our lives are great. All these different lies that we spread. We lie to others and we lie to ourselves. Yeah. We lie to ourselves for sure. So if you call yourself a Christian, what should we do about it? Be a Christian. That's what you should do. You should open the Bible up and then do what it says. Not what Jamal Bryant twists and tells you it says, but what it actually says. Um, and if you won't, do those things, then at least tell everybody that you're in favor of all these depraved and disgusting things so that we can at least know where people stand, right? This is the, the issue we deal with on this show a lot. 68% of America calls themselves Christians. 2% have a biblical worldview. Well, what are the other 66% doing, right? Not being Christians. At least stop calling yourself a Christian so we can see the mess that we're in we can recognize the mess that we're in and go, oh, this is a nation that's as pagan and religionless as any nation on the planet. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can quit sending all of our missionaries around the world and start sending them to your street corners because that's where they need to be, it into your public schools. It's funny how we, you know, people push you know, and say that religion is bad. But the thing is, everybody is worshiping something, really self. 
Yeah. We are a religious country in that sense, but it's pagan. Oh, yeah. We're a pagan religious country. We worship ourselves, our desires, for sure. Um, we put people on pedestals. I mean, people who say they are not religious, well, you, you put someone up there as if they're a god. Think that every decision they make is right. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're, that's, was it Kelvin, John Kelvin? The human heart is an idol factory. Yeah. So how should we pray about it? Well, I think we should pray that a heaviness of guilt and shame would fall over all of those who have traded God's ways for the world way or the world's ways. Uh, and I'm going to include myself in that. I pray that, you know, my conscience would be working effectively and the spirit would lead me to guilt and shame when I sin and go astray. And there's a lie in this nation that we don't need to feel guilty or that we shouldn't feel shame over our past sins. Mm. That's a lie. Guilt and shame is a blessing from God, and you should pray for that guilt and that shame, and you th should thank God mm -hmm. when you feel guilty and shameful, because that's what leads you to Christ yeah. in repentance. Those are yeah. gifts from God. When your conscience becomes hard and you're no longer moved to guilt and shame over your sin, I mean, you're Pharaoh in that position. You're, yeah. you're gone. You're lost. You know, what's interesting is people usually have a hard time seeing their own sin and but easily can point it out in others but we live in a time where people can't even see the sin in others you know what i mean yeah they're agreeing with wickedness that's so obvious um the hypocrisy is so obvious and now people don't even see the sin in others which it's just obvious well, you do not you know what i mean like we normally have to remove the plank from our own eye. Yeah. See, but gosh, there's a boulder. I mean, again, and not to make this out about Kamala Harris. I mean, I pray that she would get saved and come to faith in Christ. But like, again, we have a pastor bringing her on stage to the pulpit. And again, she will proudly proclaim that she's the first presidential candidate to make a campaign stop rally from an abortion clinic. That should be... <laughs> the most disqualifying thing you can imagine. Yeah. And yet here she is a Christian hero in a church of 10,000. You can't, I mean, how do you go from there? I don't, it's, how do you it's a blindness Christians for sure. That that's, that's okay. So I would, I pray and we should all pray that guilt and shame um, would fall all over those who profess the name of Christ. Um, and especially those who profess his name in vain. Um, which again, I think is a ever increasing number here. Um, because again, that guilt and the shame is what leads us back to the cross. Mm -hmm. um, and we, you know, we need it. We should be praying for that. And we should be praying that we would refine a love for righteousness mm -hmm. and a, you know, read Psalm 119, a love for righteousness mm -hmm. and a love for living according to God's commands, not man's sort of perverse and twisted, faulty ideas of proper living. That's a failure. We've seen the failures. So important topic. I feel like it's right around the corner um, before people start accepting that. But do you have any thoughts, any final thoughts on pedophilia being potentially right around the corner for us here in America if Christians don't begin to flee the lies of this world? I mean, it's sad, but this is the kind of stuff we have to talk about with our kids at a younger age to protect them. Um, we got to because this is just lurking everywhere. Like, yeah, just, you got to just be comfortable talking about these things. Yeah. To protect I think, the next generation, to protect your grandchildren. And, and I think that's part of that oppression that we all have to suffer under that. You don't really get to shield your kids from the world as long as you might want to. Right. You know, in, in decades gone by, you might say like, eh, you know, my kids are too young to hear about stuff like that or, they don't need to know about that now, but you know, it's year by year, your kids at a younger and younger age, you kind of have to start having these discussions about, especially if your kids, you know, in public school where, you know, they're being talked to about abortion and getting all this sort of counseling, you know, it's oppressive to the parent that like, I can't believe I'm having to talk to my 10, 11, 12 year old daughter about this type of it, stuff. But then that is convicting to do that because you just read 
in Song of Songs, like, do not awaken love before it's time. And that made, makes me think, like, well, isn't that wrong for us to talk with our kids about these kinds of things at such a young age? Like, what does that mean to awaken love before it's time? Like, I want to get more into that because I never really pondered yeah, that verse. Yeah, I've never pondered. I mean, again, we're like, kind of trusting in this gospel coalition art or uh, author's interpretation there. I don't really know. Um, I don't think that really meant like pedophilia, but you could apply it. But gosh, I mean, just no, but that are- might be speaking more to sort of just sexual immorality where maybe before they're married, you don't want to awaken that sexual desire. Right, yeah. But either way, um, whether you're married, young. Or just even and- the kids and the peer pressure to like date. I was just thinking like kids just in school and this all the the pressure to be in a relationship and they don't know what that means and they just yeah well i think you could juxtapose that with you know don't awaken it before it's time but also you know you're supposed to train your kids up in righteousness train them in the way they should go and you know you're kind of those two ideas are fighting against each other you know because the world is going to train them to go in an unrighteous ungodly way so if you're going to try to combat that with the truth of scripture you know, it's tough because, yeah, you don't want to awaken it early, but like it's there and you have to address it and guide it correctly. So, again, it's oppressive to the parent. These are not thoughts yeah. we should have to be having um, with kids as young as they are today. But we're here because, well, two reasons. Like I said, I mean, the sinful, the godless of the world have pressed it on us and the Christians have just given up ground. They've refused to stand and fight, you know. If 70% of this nation was truly sold out Christians, this would be a Christian nation that desired righteousness. And it's not. Mm -hmm. So um, we will 